biosphere is our term for the biosphere, the, the place that allows living to happen, the part of the universe in which life, such as it is, such as it mysteriously is, can, can be. Life can be in biosphere. And we change biosphere to biosphere because sphere is attaching, separating, attaching, separating. It's the dynamics that underlie our possibility. body theory says that you are not just the body proper, you are the body proper plus the architectural surround. Now we know, we have definite proof of the power of this from our work in um, uh, our piece in Nagi. In that work, we particularly organize the landing sites. We again rely on, on symmetry to do this. And we have both um, side to side and uh, above below symmetry. We heard from the director of that museum, our, our room, our tube, is one third of the Nagi Museum. And we heard back from him that a great master of key went to visit that um, museum and visited the Arakawa and Gin's room. And ran up to him to say, I want you to know that, that room has the highest concentration of ki of all Japan. Mm -hmm. That's what Madeline remembers. Arakawa said, has the highest concentration of ki of all the Orient. Oh. <laughs> so Arakawa remembered it bigger. <laughs> but this is very, very important evidence. Mm -hmm. And when I heard this, I wasn't so surprised because I said, oh yes, yes, because we organized the landing sites inside that tube. And we know that landing sites are theoretical posits, theoretical identifications of location. To begin with, people, when they are in this, this room, and I think also when they're, they're in any work of procedural architecture, they begin to feel more huge. And if you are more huge, you have more power. You mm -hmm. have more power. You are in the process of rehabilitating the body, just to begin with. Step one. Everything's changing. People have to know how, how it's all changing for anyone's health situation. And how this new science that Arakawa and I have introduced, biotopology, is very important for rehabilitation and, and healing situations too. Because biotopology asks that you take into consideration as many scales of action as you can, all at the same time. And it's not easy to do that. You cannot do that yourself. You cannot remember it all. You, you, you cannot be aware of all that you need to be aware of. But what if your house is helping you? And your house is, oh, I'm here. I'm your friend. I'm your physician. I'm your ally. I will help you remember this scale of action, that scale of action. This is necessary for you to, don't forget you need to do this. This has to happen also. There's just so many ways that, that it can be done. Yeah. We have to really tear open ignorance. For our next panel, uh, I mean, it says architectural bodies up there, but we've been talking about them all day. Uh, but we'll, we'll have a kind of different group of perspectives for, for this set of discussions. Um, our first presentation will be from Spiros Papapetros from Princeton University, one of my favorite people. Uh, and we'll also have Adrian Hart, a choreographer from the company Neon Dance, who's come from London uh, and is developing a specific dance piece inspired by Arakawa and Gin's architecture. Uh, and then uh, Giuseppe and Andres Haka uh, from the Office for Political Innovation will be the respondent. So I'm very happy to have Spiros here uh, to share his findings. Thank you.
Thank you, Irene. This is a wonderful job. Uh, I should say Irene was my TA for three years and twice <laughs> in a class called uh, The Body in Space, actually. I studied as architecture and visual arts. And so when she, she started working on the materials, she thought about it and she asked me to contribute. I was very happy to do it, even though I had no familiarity with her work before that. So what I will do today is actually less of a lecture than a close reading seminar. I have to warn you about that. <laughs> So I'll talk only about a single book project published in 2002 by the University of Alabama Press, of which I propose to do this close reading. How do I turn? Here. Just the arrows. Here. No, no, this forward. Okay. Great. Uh, since the book has no images, even while describing architecture, and that was apparently a conscious decision by the two, I will also use no images, with the exception of only one, to describe their work, so that their voice, perhaps, comes across more clearly without an image. But images will accompany side references to the work of other architects or authors. The third chapter of Madeleine Gaines and Arakawa's book, Architecture Body, titled Architecture as a Hypothesis, describes a hypothetical walk between Gins and Arakawa and what would presumably be a couple of prospective clients, Robert and Angela, touring a house or a full model of a house the two architects have apparently prepared for them. I quote, Arakawa, here is the house we were telling you about. Angela, I don't see any house here. Gins, granted this is not what in our time most people dream of coming home to. Robert, this heap? Gins, Yes, a low pile of material that covers fairly vast area. Angela, are we at a dump? This low pile covering a vast area? Gins, what you take to be a pile of junk ranges in height from 3 to 11 inches. It measures close to 2,400 square feet, or 2,900 square feet if you include the courtyard. Robert, courtyard? Gins, the shining part in the middle, that has a lot of green around it, that's the courtyard. After Angela, Angela commented that it was hilarious that even the surrounding shrubbery, uh, shrubbery was taller than this 11-inch maximum horizontal layer of a house, Arakawa proposed to the equally alarmed and equally bemused visitors to take a walk around this supine homestead, to which Robert gradually retorts, why bother? I can see any, everything from here. To which Gins responds that it is wonderful to be able to uh, see everything at once like a plant. But Angela comments, well, that would make this pile of junk a very bumpy blueprint, end quote. Here the reader of Gins and Arakawa's narrative interlude might start asking, where are we? Or where are they? Are we at a remote lot, uh, looking at an actual structure, or at an office, where the pair of architects demonstrate a future house to clients through blueprints and drawings. The very principle of reversibility here between 2D and 3D is right here in this procedure. The dilemma is a false one, since we are apparently outside, even the house is that flat as bumpy blueprint. Ginsen Arakawa's book emulates the structure of a Renaissance treatise. Polyphilo might come to mind, or three centuries later, what less picturesque sur le jardin, where we are witnessing a dialogue in which a guy takes an unsuspecting visitor for an architectural walk, displaying all sorts of an unbuilt or natural marvels, and yet one can never say or be sure exactly where all of this is taking place, and even if one is talk, taking a walk in the outset, one still has a hunch that you have actually never left the author's studiolo, his salon, his writing desk, and in this case, an office. In this chapter layout and bodily distribution, architectural body is symmetrically divided into nine parts of exactly 100 pages of text total, which makes the missing 10th part, were it to be another Vitruvius, which exists in the library, even more tantalizing. Each part or section has a different theme, yet there are plenty of thematic repetitions between chapters which take the edifice of this architectural body uh, book read as a rhythmic structure. At the very preface of the book, we have another dialogue between the two authors attempting to explain the title Architectural Body, which is actually the only image on the cover, which is an image of a text. 
where they wonder whether, after all, the back and forth they have they got it right. And then they mention their last other choice, which was constructing life, which they ultimately abandoned since the work was more about reconfiguring life rather than an out-and-out construction, even if their work had to do with self-organization, autopiesis, artificial life, and consciousness studies. But still, this was not the title, so the authors spend more time explaining a title that they abandoned and less the one that they chose in the end, that is, the architectural body. So what is the architectural body? Perhaps the abandoned title of constructing or reconfiguring life might in fact give us a hint. Famously, in his Order of Things, Michel Foucault declared that life itself did not exist in the 19th century and that it only came into being with the establishment of the scientific discipline of biology after 1800. This modern invention of life was informed by a series of architectonic parameters into the growth and spatial behavior of living organisms. Architecture functioned as a typological blueprint and as an epistemological parameter describing the methods of organization within the processes of life, now expanding from human to mineral structures. The very practice that would initially appear to fix and stabilize matter was re-employed in order to transform, move, and even animate formerly dead materials by its tectonic powers of organization. And it was precisely the emerging science of tectonics, interrogating the formation of all bodies, natural and artificial, that offered an insight into the processes of life and their impeding architecturalization, to borrow a term used in the 20th century by Le Corbusier, architecture, as they strive to adapt within a rapidly transforming environment. Architecture then was understood not only as a system that facilitated living processes, such as the movement or repose of human bodies, but also as an entity that itself was animate, living, and had a body. The soul is the architect of its own body. L'âme est l'architecte de son propre corps, argues the 19th century philosopher Albert Remois in his memoir of the vitalist and animist theories of 17th century medical philosopher Georges N. Stahl. Following Stahl, via Lemoine, all human bodies possess an architectonic soul, une âme architectonique, that can organize all living matter, give form to each body it inhabits, which would otherwise remain melange of uh, unorganized particles. Reinvigorated by the invention of the life sciences, now every form of tectonics had to start with life itself. Life would eventually become the archi, meaning origin or beginning, as well as authority and power, behind architecture. Architecture itself is not life, as buildings are not living, vivant, but vivifying, vivific, as they enable the conditions of life to take place. Adhering to issues of epigeneticists and rejecting theories of supporting an a priori preformation of life, 19th century medical epistemology of the soul could refabricate the body throughout life and perpetually redefine its living materials. For the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th, the major evolutionary processes that would connect life, bodies, and architecture would include adaptation, optimization, and the special claims of natural selection. Darwin is in the library of Jinsen Arakawa. For Jinsen Arakawa, these constructive life processes are, quote, self-organization, autopiesis, and artificial life several books on that in the library as well, which means that they took the entire process of the architecturalization or what they call reconfiguration of life to a whole new level. And that's the level of the reversible destiny and of conquering or reconfiguring death by a tentative elimination and or its deconstruction. This may not be entirely against the reconstructive principles of 19th century architectural reinvention of life and its symptoms. According to Stahl and Lemoine, the soul is not only the architect, but also the doctor of its body, la médecin de son corps. The soul holds power over the reciprocal processes of remedy and malady. It can allow the body to get sick and then aid it to recuperate. Also, it can drive the body to decay and to deaths in organic inertia. Death is the effective endpoint of this living architecture, the ultimate destination of the soul's plan and its tectonic formation. But in Ginsen Arakawa, the same scenario is reversed. 
I quote from the architectural body, quote, the defeatists are everywhere within the life sciences. They try to cure the human body or figure it out such as they find it to be, never attempting to reconfigure it altogether, never thinking to reorder the body radically so that it might elude mortality, end quote. An architecturally guided and sustained organism person should be able to reverse that destiny known to have been the lots of billions of other uh, members of our species, end quote. Perhaps one can further think of reversibility here, the reversible destiny, as part of Ginza Narakawa's main organizing principle or architectural hypothesis of choice evolving around the idea of tentativeness, an idea that structures the bios cleave, their version of the bio or the living sphere as we heard, as a demonstrably tentative constructing towards holding in place, which implies that the architectural words constructed inside cannot be anything but tentative. As they say, tentativeness is not simply about the fleeting nature of things, including architectural works, but about an intrinsic tentativeness within the biosphere that all living things, which architecture helps to remain living, applies. For them, this is a totally constructed tentativeness, a sure-footed, rightful hesitation on the hesitating mark. It's an antidote to the person's self certainty, and such hesitation needs to be put in precise order in order to work, uh, to be in relation to works of architecture. Demonstrating the ins and outs of viability, these structures one feels as if walking inside a tentatively constructed hypothesis, an architecture of as if, similar to the philosophy of as if by Hans Weyinger at the beginning of the last century that signals a condition between idealism and objectivity. But let us now return to the two couples that we left earlier about the architectural narrative of the house visit that started this paper. With the architectural guidance of the two life designers, eventually Angela and Robert start adapting to their new house as they are asked to use their own body to activate and reform the space. Quote, Robert, I begin now to see what is ex expected from us in here. First off, we need to stretch our limbs as much as possible. When I stretch my arms up as if I am about to hit a volleyball, the material rides up and I can see a fairly large area. Is that the kitchen facility? Is it a kitchen in the center? Gins, yes, that's the kitchen. Your arms are raised up high, atlas supporting the globe. And do you see where that gets you? It gets you to a house that begins to have rooms, Angela. Rooms form depending on how we move. If I bend down, I nearly lose the room. Would you open up the room a little more where you are? Robert, I will play a carry added, and you go off to the farthest end. I'm beginning to feel more at ease with all of this. Like an atlas and then a caryatid, when one should be able to hold or carry the world, or at least one's own house, on one's head. The house does not passively carry the inhabitants, it is they who hold it together and actively support it. Similar to how one flexes her muscles, a person should be able to flex her surroundings, as both Kins and Kwarakaya note, are with her now and of her always. And as the architect continue, you're not given a finished house, but instead something you can form throughout your movements and through those that whoever else is there with you. Architectural surroundings are elaborately structured pretexts for action. They pre-exist the person, and they are already there, waiting to be entered and encountered even when in disarray. They essentially function upon the person and become perceived as atmospheric conditioners. That's their expression. In his unpublished manuscript titled Magic Architecture, The Story of Human Housing, Frederick Kistler, that there is a monograph in the library, would narrate the first entry into the habitation of pre- or proto-humans in caves as an active quest for reformation of their own bodies. Kistler would imagine uh, the ancestors of the human species, quote, crawling on four legs into his habitat with more ease than his later erect stance would permit. Then, after he became upright, that is, the human, he had to bed down to get through the door, and once inside, he remained crouched. Finally, he raised the roof of his new home to the full height of his stature, end quote, and that was Kistler. We see here that for Kistler, the cave is not a ready-made. Like a living organism, the cave develops in conformity with the body of the proto-human and vice versa. 
The story resembles the Lacanian mirror stage, in which the cave plays the role of the trot bebe, a prosthetic scaffold that supports the contingent body of the developing human being. But Kisler's story, just like Gins and Karakawa's, underlined the codependency between the body and the tectonic prosthesis. The house, like Kisler's cave, elastically transforms to accommodate man's transition from horizontality to verticality, yet it always carries the memory of that crouching body that originally crawled in its interior. The house is not a finished frame inside which the body is installed, but instead it's an extension of the human figure that, akin to a spider web, gradually emanates from the body and develops in conformity with it. Ginsen Arakawa mentioned in the architectural body that, quote, it would be ridiculous for someone to use a flashlight to find the path out of a labyrinthine cave. End quote. One has to bump against uneven walls and low overhangs or trip upon rocks and stalagmites and then slide into and splash through shallow puddles so as to start wondering if indeed this might be a hollow out figment of your imagination. End quote. That is extracting the cave, the Ua architectural surrounding from its solid framework and recasting it into the plane of tentative possibility. Another similarity here is with Kisler's other original model of habitation, that is, the animal nest, such as the orangutans, makeshift night shelter made of leaves from surrounding tree branches. The cave adapts the logic of the nest and vice versa. Angela and Robert are asked actually to return to that stage where every day and every night they would have to resemble and raise the reassemble and raise the house from the horizontal pile of junk, as the first call it, to the constantly and actively to be constantly and actively reaccommodated. Another animal metaphor that describes Kins and Arakawa's architectural body is the snail. Human snails go on carrying their architectural surroundings which are glued bodily on them like second skins, through which, in the best case scenario, creates a form of interpenetration with their environment, breathing in and out, creating what they call complementary tones as well as passive and active elements. This living shell is, quote, thick with one's own breathing, end quote. Its thickness is achieved by the amount of possibilities for what they call landing site configurations, which shall swallow them, but also heuristically expel, exude, and disperse while going through. The way that this snail-like architectural skin is formed is by a, quote, kinesthetic casting, a cast layer created by the perceptions arousing, arising from the body's movement. For them, persons are always, quote, kinesthetically grounded, figured and reconfigured. Everything happens by kinesthetic instigation or corporeal proddings, since all events, uh, kinesthetic repercussions, create a mobile and sculpted medium of locatings and landings. Through such kinesthetic casting, they argue, the house prompts your actions. Once tactile surroundings are closing on her, they sculpt kinesthetic possibility or kinesthetic with itness. The sculpted kinesthetic with itness, the, tentative, the tentativeness of any moment, can be thought of as the matrix of the person. While strongly related to the processes of imaging, such portable casting net can never be achieved with merely optical means. They mention, for example, um, and that's another iteration of that casting. They mention, for example, the famous Ames Room, uh, designed and constructed by the ophthalmologist Andelbert Ames in the 1940s, based apparently on the writings of the 19th century physicist, physiologist, and master of psychotechnics, Heinrich Helmholtz, creating optical illusions of giant and small figures, and that all of this illusion could instantly vanish, though, once the viewer, armed with a stick, probes the room's interior, say Ginsen Arakawa. And if she or he learns tactilely and kinesthetically that the floor slopes and that the structure of this room is anything but ordinary. So that's the refutation, actually, of some of the principles of cognitive psychology implied here. This proprioceptive kinesthetic sculpting of the house does not mean that it precludes practical living functions. As Keynes explains to Angela and Robert, everything that can be done in an ordinary house can be done in this one, but some maneuvering might be necessary. Each piece of material on the pile, you see, has ribs or spokes that open like those of an umbrella, ready to be activated. Ex expanding mechanisms lie at four-foot intervals, end quote. Gins further explains that everyday house activities like cooking can also take place in the house depending on the setting 
one chooses to operate the house and which causes the material to close back in and down. Moreover, when the house operates through, quote, remote control switches that can then operate sensors that bloom and fabricate the house. And this is also what allows it to become livable by those who are ill or handicapped. All three of these models of an architectural body we've seen so far, the snail or the house as a protractable second skin, the house as an atmospheric conditioner, and finally the house that has a number of different settings in which it can be adjusted, go back to the ideas of the biological and ecological reconceptualization of architectural space as a main brain in Siegfried Ebeling's 1926 small pamphlet published at Dessau by this former student of the Bauhaus. Ebeling conceives of space not only as a permeable membrane, but also as a vegetal husk, a tree bark or a mineral shell that allows the living cube to communicate and absorb the ionized particles of the atmosphere. His few design projects show a house organism that is entirely controlled by the human hand by a set of valves that adjust the mood of the space by altering light and air conditions. His texts and his projects, as himself prophesied, would not, be unknown, it would not be known unless if, perhaps in 20 years later, some biologically and ecologically inclined community would pick up those ideas. It took perhaps twice as long for some of these architectural ideas of inflatable domes and other things to be revived in the 1960s, and another 20 or even 40 years for him, Ebeling, that is, to be rediscovered. But that's Ebeling's reversible destiny. The architectural bodies of Gintz and Arakawa are with us in this moment and did not have to wait that long. By the end of their walk around the house, Angela and Robert are totally convinced. Angela, this entire house is landing on me, on us. There are so many landings, I hardly know where to begin. Robert, when I breathe in, there are lots of landings as a result of that. I'm feeling my breathing more than I ever had before. And at this point, Angela decides to lay down, crouch, curl her body and take a nap into this cozy place. Arakawa was thrilled that the pair had linked breathing with landing. They didn't know that before. As if that marked the moment that the architectural body had been resuscitated by that very breath and grounded with that landing. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Adrian Hart of Neon Dance. Hi, everyone. Hi. Are you all right? There's <laughs> lots of people talking at you. Um, yeah, my name is Adrienne Hart. I'm the artistic director of Neon Dance. Um, we're based in the UK, and it's been a pleasure, and thank you for inviting me to come here to talk to you all. Um, I, I will be talking, but I also have some artefacts to share with you that are um, a part of a brand new work that I'm developing. And I've never been asked to talk about a work that doesn't exist yet, so this is a first. <laughs> um, I, I'm developing a new work called Puzzle Creature that's been inspired by the work of Arakara Madeline Gins. And it's been a, a really fascinating process to go through. Uh, I was exposed to their work through uh, Leopold that's here today and, um, and spoke to you all earlier. Uh, at the time, I was uh, making a, a piece called, called Empathy. And uh, I, I was really utilizing uh, the Funambulist, which is um, a, it's now a physical magazine, but at the time it was only online, as a resource. And there was some um, wonderful work there, including a, a podcast from Mameo, also here, um, that exposed me to um, reversible destiny lofts um, in memory of Helen Keller. And um, the, I had the opportunity to go out to Japan, where uh, the lofts are based, um, and also to explore both the lofts and the, the park, uh, the site of reversible destiny. And, and then I came back to the UK and pulled together a team of artists that I thought might be interesting to bring together to respond to this body of work. And I think already from the number of speakers and, and the diverse disciplines standing up here and, and talking about Arakara and Gins, 
you can see how how um, how much they've influenced many different um, uh, you know, mathematicians, architects, uh, choreographers, uh, such a such a wide range of people, um, and that's that's incredible to me as, as a as a choreographer. My, my work with, with Neon Dance, it's about bringing together artists from different disciplines to create work that we couldn't have created alone. Um, and, and for me, Arka and Gins, they, they personify that. And, um, and I'm, I'm every day exploring more and more about their work. And today, I'm talking about Puzzle Creature, but already um, I'm, I'm starting to think about beyond that, and perhaps I'll continue making several other pieces after, after this one. <laughs> we will see. Um, so le let me introduce you to Puzzle Creature. As I do, you'll, you'll see um, an image of my dancer, Kara Staton, uh, performing with uh, what we refer to as um, uh, an artifact. Uh, I've been working with a, uh, an artist who in initially trained as an architect called Anna Rekovic. And uh, when we were talking about creating an environment for um, uh, for puzzle creature and and for my performers to uh, work within, we we started to think about the idea of the body and how repeated actions, meaning that that we become fixed perhaps in our way of thinking, in our way of being, um, uh, and. As, as a dancer, as a choreographer, um, meaning that we get um, stuck in, in creating the same type of movement vocabulary. So she came up with this idea of using this mesh type material uh, that has the ability to, um, and I, I, I have this mask that I'll sh share around in a second, but um, it comes as, as um, a rigid material, and you can dunk it in hot water, and then it becomes um, fluid, um, uh, soft and malleable, and you can cast it on a limb, uh, on a light, on a chair, and within an instant it becomes fixed and stuck. Uh, and, and so we found this a really interesting uh, device for generating movement material, um, but also it means that uh, if we wanted to, we could then put it back into boiling water and it would reverse its destiny, it would become floppy again and then you could recast it into something new. Um, so just as I carry on talking, I've got my little bag, I wish I, I've got hundreds of these, but I, there's only so many I could fit in my luggage. So. Um, the, this is uh, one of them that I'll pass around, and you can, you can try and guess what this is. This is your uh, challenge for the day. So, um, and, and just to say, I've um, uh, and I will talk a little bit more specifically about about the work itself as well. But just to say, um, I. <laughs> Through, through Arakar and Gins, I really started to think about how I've been making work up until now. And it's been for an audience that are generally sitting in chairs as passive spectators. And I really, specifically when, when looking at um, the lofts and how they've been designed with the body of Helen Keller in mind, it, it kind of woke me up a bit, actually. Um, and starting to think about different bodies and how they might... Um, engage in the space collectively and and so I've been kind of on a journey with this work um, and, and speaking to lots of different groups uh, and, and inviting them to um, give me feedback and that's informing the piece that we're making so I've been working with a group called the Brailleists in Bristol um, who are um, a group who are visually impaired um, and and I, I brought these objects in, in with me uh, and it was really fun seeing them um, uh, try to, to guess what, what some of them are, but also uh, for, for an individual that was um, visually impaired uh, and trying to work out the, the face object, and they were starting to place it on a shoulder or a knee, and, and I thought, how wonderful that, that these shapes that are formed from one body part can fit and find uh, a way onto another, uh, and, and it got me inspired in terms of... Um, how, how movement can can shift and and uh, and change. So, um, as as that's doing the, the rounds, um, I've never worked with one of these before, so <laughs> you have to. Okay, perfect. So I'd like to 
um, describe our, our thinking. I'm really open for anyone that, that's um, uh, uh, interested in what I have to say today. Uh, co come give me feedback on this because it's in the making. Uh, next month we go to Berlin to try a, um, a, a scaled down version of this and then um, we, we premiere in Japan and then we come to the UK after that. But we, we're, we're still um, it, very much in the creation process. So one, a, a few things became very clear when I, I started to research the world of Arakawa and Gins. Uh, as I said, audience, they can't be sitting in chairs. This felt <laughs> very clearly not, not right. Um, the audience need to be in and part of the work. So for the first time ever, that's what we're doing. Uh, we're, we're finding venues where either we can uh, take away the seating or perhaps using uh, going away from the theatre and working in a, perhaps a museum or a gallery space. Um, the... I mean, you can see maybe <laughs> where the bumpy floor influences come from. Uh, we, we made a conscious decision that, of course, if Arakawa and Gins were still alive today, uh, they, I would be pleading with them to collaborate with me, but they're, they're, they're not. So I've, I've worked with an incredible design collective called Newman to come up with a response to their work. We're trying not to uh, replicate, but hopefully offer a, a sense of... Uh, some of the philosophy around um, uh, architectural bodying. And uh, it was really nice to, to hear uh, the kind of theory before that because uh, these designs that are up here right now uh, are very much uh, from that, that theory um, and, and how perhaps both performer and audience member can collectively occupy the same space. Um, Another aspect of the work is um, my score. We've chosen to create a surround sound score uh, where the sound will have a, a physical aspect um, in, in the work. And, and again, thinking about not being so reliant on the, the visual world um, and, and perhaps if instead um, you, you consider how sound might be in a space, then it might travel um, across you, um, underneath you, it might surround you. Uh, and, and so we've started that journey, and, and it's been a real privilege to work with some of the archival um, uh, materials from Madeline and um, Arakawa. Uh, having them physically in the space with us seems to, um, for, for me, to... Um, make the work more real and, and, and also introduce a whole, whole new group of people to their, their philosophy, to their way of thinking. Uh, I can tell you that the very opening of Puzzle Creature will open with the, the words of Madeline speaking at my audience um, and saying hello. Um, a final couple of things to add about Puzzle Creature. Um, with it, it's, really, it's really got the, um, Helen Keller in mind as, as a body, but, but also I'm wondering, I'm, I'm interested in what happens when we, we take away um, certain senses but then introduce others. Uh, I'm going to be working with a, a British Sign Language and Japanese Sign Language um, uh, communicator. And one of the interesting processes in, in this is that some of the words, for example, reversible destiny, doesn't exist in British sign language. Um, so we're having to invent them um, and going through the, the... And I feel that this could be a really nice thing to contribute back to um, uh, BSL and, and we're just starting that journey with, with JSL. Um, but the the... What I've found so far is that uh, those that I've worked with, that I've started to talk about Arika and Gin's work too, uh, they've, they've felt really empowered by the work. Um, and, and just to end, there's, there's a group that I've been working with recently that are called the Company of Elders. Um, and they're all over the age of 60. Um, and um, a, a dance company based in London at Sadler's Wells Theatre. Um, and, and one of the, um, the group... They, uh, they normally have to w walk with a cane, so making reference to that, that story earlier. Um, but 
um, with, uh, she says, oh, when I dance, I don't need my cane. Um, and, and so I, I really loved the story to know that when, when you're in the loft, you don't need a cane either. So um, for, for me, Ara Karangin's work s s fits so well with, within the realm of, of um, dance and, and uh, the body being the central tenant of a, any given space. Um, I'm, I feel really at home when I got to stay in the lofts and um, I adored being at the park. I, I managed to survive without breaking any limbs. Um, I, I think I'm going to leave it there. I know we're going to open it up to conversations, but um, yeah, I, I, I think this is hopefully... I, these are just some very early sketches. Um, if you get to come and see the show, you will get to be part of the final thing. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, so the idea is it's air, so that you could physically be moved by an air bubble um, around the space. Um, and, and one thing, actually, we, we've just recently, I, I, I came straight from London, and I had a, it's called a wild card at, at Sadler's Wells, um, where the audience were mostly having to sit on the floor, and they were saying how uncomfortable it was, and it was a flat floor. Um, and it was, it was a really interesting um, process to go through and, and to consider how I take care of my audience um, so that they can be active in the space um, uh, and, and that the, there are many ways of, of uh, not just standing or sitting in one fixed way for a huge amount of time. Um, perhaps they can sit, lie, hang, lean, um, and, and that... Their, their, their body's engagement with the space is very much part of, of the work. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian. And now Andreas Haka will lead the conversation with Adrian and Spiros. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's start right away. Uh, there's so much to discuss. And uh, please, if someone wants to do a question, raise your hands and I'll take notes. And uh, we'll try to, to uh, take as many as possible. I, I, well, I, I'm very, very interested on in the connections of your two presentations in a way. I'm glad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm for, for instance, it was very interesting that uh, you were using the word uh, entity. Um, to, to talk about both human and also the architecture at one point, and you were talking of artifacts uh, when you were uh, discussing these masks. Uh, these terms, of course, are not naive at all, and uh, very much kind of, in a way, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're both reclaiming a little bit of a way of describing these processes in, in which uh, there's certain symmetry uh, in the encounter of different uh, bodies or uh, entities, uh, mm. the humans and the non-humans, let's say. And I want to stop here in this pro moment in which both get to adapt to each other uh, to somehow they show their codependence uh, and uh, it seems to be also uh, taking Spiro's words uh, 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 from uh, uh, Arakawa and, and Gins, uh, the construction of, of life in a way. So maybe you can, uh, and in your case, Adrian, for instance, this uh, need of uh, an interaction between the, uh, the, the, the whole installation in which the audience uh, meet the performers uh, also seems to be mediated by a process of adaptation to something that somehow is both shaping uh, those human bodies, but it's also equally shaping uh, the space and the form in which they're uh, meeting. So I think this process of mutual adaptation, mutual affection, in a way, it's crucial in, your both, pres in both your presentations. So maybe we can start with this. Uh, Spiros, maybe you want to... Oh, it's a lot. <laughs> First of all, about entity, uh, I wanted to use a term that is as neutral as possible, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, their term is person. And you have to do the work to become a person and interact with one's surroundings, uh, right? That uh, happens uh, gradually. Um, so th that's important. In the, on the second question about 
how do you actually achieve that status uh, through biological processes? Uh, while the classic biological process of the 19th century will be precisely adaptation, optimization, they're using the, sangu the language of a new form of biology that is autopiesis, uh, self-organization, Manuel de Landa is in their library, <laughs> for example. They're very interested in epigenesis and autogenesis, anything that would avoid heredity and preformation, right? Uh, fixation. So all of that is there, but I like the term person, actually, yeah. because it's used a lot by also contemporary <laughs> anthropologists that are new animists. That is, you person the world, and even objects can be, and animals can become persons, yeah. right? That they have qualities and agencies within it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. I. Um, I guess it's also another point that I, I, I got into, if anyone's heard of Vernon Lee, who um, did a lot of work on aesthetics, and, um, and how, I think it was a, a book on um, uh, beauty and ugliness in 18, oh, 18 something, late 18, 1800s. And she, um, she talked about the effect um, art and architecture had on the, on the body. Um, and hinted at this in our entangled nature with our environment, and and I and I think that um, uh, is it Madeline that said, "Don't be so damn sure of yourself." <laughs> and I, I like this idea of of creating an environment for an audience to uh, become conscious of of what's. Um, uh, is this table solid or um, over time can it also decay and, and yeah. meet at its end um, or renew and, and be recycled into something new? Um, the, the body is a, a fascinating thing where you can physically see changes. Um, if you don't see a family friend, uh, a, a family member for a year and then you come and see them again, you can notice a change in them. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's this thing of, um, yeah, the, the, the noticing and, and um, uh, being consciously aware of, of um, uh, our uh, body and our surroundings and it, the, the fact that they're one and the same, well, they can. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in that moment where uh, tentativeness or hesitation is preserved in a bodily level. That is, you never master things or control them in the end, even though you might, you know, you have done the same movements a hundred times. Mm -hmm. I was very intrigued to hear that, you know, even people who have worked in the office so many times, they would still bump and trip in, yeah. in all of these environments. Well, that actually might be part of the agenda in a way that you never master something, right? Tentativeness yeah. has to be preserved. You're never self-assured. That's the kind of care and respect uh, that you have for your environment. That's tentativeness to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, what it, uh, how does relate, uh, in your opinion, to the process of awareness? Uh, because it's true that Momoyo, Momoyo, for instance, was mentioning that when you went to uh, Europark, uh, you, you had injured yourself, you have bounds. And uh, so, so in a way, there is a process that is very physical of really even mm -hmm. Suffering in your body transformations, as the one that you were mentioning, but in the case of Momoya, for instance, is even bounds. Um, and it's a process of, also of, let's say, uh, learning, a creation of certain aware self mm -hmm. mutual mm -hmm. awareness. So there's two processes that w one seems to be bodily, the other seems to be more intellectual, but in your readings, both things mm -hmm. come together mm -hmm. somehow. Well, it's yeah. that issue of kinesthetic exactly. knowing, yeah. <laughs> almost, exactly. right, or knowing yeah. from uh, the body. Uh, uh, symptomatically, yesterday we had a discussion with Zeynep yeah. Chalik, precisely exactly. on her book, Kinesthetic Knowing, at Princeton. So yeah. it was interesting for me to prepare for two very different events that actually were very much related, <laughs> and uh, a kinesthesia <laughs> was very much at the very heart of them. So uh, you can learn uh, precisely by the body and uh, acquire some kind of awareness. Robert and Angela that we heard about, <laughs> that's exactly what we got to hear. It's their journey of awareness of that space that they would see as a jungle pile and in the end they would get to be aware of it, of their own possibilities within yeah. that house that they're actually mm -hmm. synesthetically <laughs> and kinesthetically. Yeah, and um, uh, for me, in response to that, and the, the idea of falling or slipping, and uh, how if you can be, um, uh, there is a way to, 
it's interesting as you're falling if you if you do this <laughs> you're more likely to break a bone if if you let go and release and mm -hmm. go into the floor um, then <laughs> a tip <laughs> next time you're at euro park um, <laughs> then then you are less likely to hurt yourself um, so there are uh, it, by giving in to um, gravity to uh, accepting the floor you're less yeah. likely to hurt yourself <laughs> Uh, bringing back the, uh, the, the reference uh, of Leo, uh, Leopold uh, of uh, the normative bodies and uh, uh, how that translated also to, for instance, horizontality in flows. Uh, the way you describe these processes are something that somehow would be very difficult uh, in a normative space that is already kind of avoiding uh, this um, uh, process of uh, basically needing to adapt as the space also adapt to two bodies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, actually, both the, the, the collection of the cases that, that you brought, Spiros, could never be probably uh, uh, included in the uh, normative spaces or hegemonies that Leopold was talking about, in the case, for instance, of Kisler, very clearly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm the space that you're creating probably will have very many difficulties to get uh, uh, licenses and to comprise with the regulation. So in a way, there's certain, and I take your uh, uh, expression, setting, that somehow is avoiding these uh, regulatory uh, hegemonies here in the cases. That, so it, this architecture seems to put itself in a uh, uh, a realm of experimentation with the tentativeness, it's, uh, it's expressed very vividly. It's bodily uh, experience in a very clear uh, uh, way, alternative to probably ordinary experiences. Uh, yeah. what, what is this uh, experimentation character or kind of experimental character of these works? Uh, what's the importance of this? Uh -huh. I would say the not not aware of this normativeness actually yeah. is right there. I mean, there's Vitruvius there, there are the Cariatids. What's more of a normative yeah. <laughs> with these women, They're depressed actually by the <laughs> thing that they have to carry on their heads, but they turn them on their heads. Somehow, yeah. or they turn on their heads these kind of normative procedures. The one example that I show is that was the Maison Domino by Corbusier. What can be even more normative, yeah, yeah. right? It's but true. they uh, readapted it with their own casting, the synesthetic casting inside it to say that's how actually the architecture frame should have been uh, mm -hmm. created. So the normals are there implicitly in the work as almost graphic representations of what can be done beyond them, actually. Yeah. How can you almost corrupt them or pervert yeah. them? Uh, some of the processes they describe in this house that you know you have to crawl in, <coughs> and raise it up, seem you know established traditional architectural ways uh, <laughs> of verticality, raising up. But then again, they challenge that as well. They can collapse at any time with these multiple settings. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's essential. I think all buildings should look <laughs> like the <laughs> ones proposed by, uh, I, I want that hotel to exist. I want to, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, and, and it's fun fundamental because people are producing work in these spaces. Yeah. They are uh, dance studios, for example. Mm -hmm. They're all flat floors. They tend to have bars, even though um, only a proportion of people produce ballet anymore. So <laughs> bars and a mirror will uh, colour and inscribe way of being on the body, perhaps make it more architectural and uh, change mm -hmm. the movement vocabulary that's produced. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I think what Madeline's doing with the poetry is, is this scrambling effect with language is very, very interesting yeah. for me as well. Uh, uh, reminds me of William Burroughs and the cut-up yeah. technique as a, as a vehicle for producing uh, other ways to um, yeah, ma make mm -hmm. work and to uh, derail your way of thinking. So mm -hmm. it's, it's essential. What, what is the way that you, uh, Aiden, in your work, accumulate uh, the uh, let's say, the experience of the tentative uh, approaches. So what is the way the, the, the space, the bodies, the choreographies are registering for the uh, result of the evolution uh, of the tentative approaches to the work? Uh, I think I, I I think that's probably why we've gone down the route of working yeah. with these these artifacts because my my dancers they've trained for so many years they they are um, experts in in <laughs> moving eloquently yeah. beautifully um, uh, and and so how on earth do I disrupt that and <laughs> make them tentative and, yeah. and uh, I, I certainly think this environment will do that so that I was <laughs> proposing earlier. 
Um, I think having um, uh, the unknown um, quantity of, of audience members roaming within that, that space yeah. will, will do it as well. Um, and, and having, uh, for example, did anyone guess what the um, uh, other piece was for? <laughs> was it this, uh, like a hand? Or? It's over uh, there, it actually. Was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> any guess? Do you have any clues? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's um, you're very close. It's um, it's actually, I mean, it's a trick question because it's made with two different uh, bodies <laughs> together. Um, oh, so it's two yeah, hands. Two hands, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, which again, uh, this <laughs> idea of tentativeness, if you're used to having one body and then become attached to another body, um, mm -hmm. I think this is a, a vehicle for, for mm -hmm. that to occur, mm -hmm. maybe. <laughs> Probably there's already questions, comments, complaints. Uh, like, <laughs> uh, well, I have one more. Uh, uh, I, I have many more, but, but I have one now. You ended with a very kind of uh, mysterious sentence, this, uh, this grounding uh, without landing. Maybe you can develop a little bit on that. What do you think is, the, is uh, behind these words? Actually, it was grounding or to how to well, grounded uh, without land uh, like maybe, it, yeah, maybe uh, I don't know maybe, yeah. <laughs> but maybe. it had to relate actually landing to grounding in yeah. some way I find it very interesting that in the conclusion of all of this uh, yeah, Angela just lays down and rests yeah. asleep which is the ultimate way to show that this is cozy you can sleep you know what can be even more intimate uh, in this case uh, so that way it, it was precisely it, it, usually these landings are most successful yeah. when they uh, end up to the body itself mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. that was the moment that uh, somehow the body uh, reacquired its horizontality right yeah. the very thing that we said with mm -hmm. Kistler and others is precisely what mm -hmm. tried to have uh, it regrounded itself, but after it has uh, acquired this kind of awareness of verticality and the, whatever she could do uh, of the house, now she kind of relents and just lay down to sleep. Mm -hmm. So that's the grounding of mm -hmm. <coughs> What about the breathing? Because the breathing is... Yeah, breathing yeah. is very important. I mean, very important. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. it's, you know, one of these traditions that brings the body to space from the 19th century on, even in Nietzsche's uh, The Birth of Tragedy, precisely what relates body to space is the breathing, the regularity of breathing in and out. Mm -hmm. And that creates rhythm, and that creates precisely space, mm -hmm. which 19th century theories of space would talk about. That's how the body relates to space, actually, mm -hmm. through breathing, this innate process that is already in the body. Right? Mm -hmm. What do you think is the role of uh basically Arakawa and Yin's here, because for instance, uh, you were asking before uh, uh, about the notation system that mm -hmm. you were using. I was asking, yeah, 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 yeah you, you were asking. Notation. So it's maybe a discussion that we can bring here, because in a way, uh, the, the role of, of Yin's, for instance, here, and Arakawa writing the story for, for An Angela and Robert, is very peculiar, they're kind of in control of all the, the story. Mm -hmm. uh, in your case, for instance, you're preparing this situation, but in a way it's probably uh, very unexpected and very uncertain, the evolution of it. So there's a question also of where's the design uh, sure, operating sure. here yeah, in yeah. both cases, yeah. Um, it's, it's a difficult one to answer because it's still in the making. So <laughs> this, like, um, I, I certainly, I mean, I was, I was saying I end up with a script by the end of yeah. uh, a making process. Um, with, with this work, uh, yeah, there is a, there's an unknown element to it, which is my audience or, um, yeah, <laughs> organisms that person. Um, uh, and, and how, um, yeah, I, I, I guess it, it's almost that um, uh, each event will have its own particular um, uh, uh, outcome and it's uh, we, we can set mm -hmm. up uh, possibilities we can imagine things we can ensure we take care of, of the audience but um, uh, yeah there's there's no one way to predict mm -hmm. it necessarily or, or mm -hmm. to um, uh, yeah and, and in terms of documentation or, mm -hmm. or no notating mm -hmm. it's I mean I'm still I'm still very um, uh, someone mentioned VR earlier. I mean, is, mm -hmm. is that a way to document or to notate it truly? 
<laughs> so that you could only relive one audience or one performer's experience by <laughs> going through it yourself. <laughs> No, the, the reason that I brought this story in as kind of, and I made it yeah. the spine of the presentation is, mm -hmm. yeah, I was really struck at that moment that uh, they take what could have been, we don't know, <laughs> hypothetical clients, friends, yeah. what is this couple, um, for a site visit, right, yeah. that we would normally do. Uh, and then suddenly the husband says, oh, but this is just like looking at a plan. Yeah. Uh, we can see everything, <laughs> it's so horizontal. So they are immediately, you're transported back as it's been, in a, and looking at a drawing while you are on a site, right? <laughs> so this kind of reversibility uh, to me was extremely interesting of a uh, reversibility that would apply to spaces, yeah. right? From 2D, the space of the drawing, to the space of the actual site. And that's why it's very interesting when Angela said, well, this is a very bumpy blueprint. <laughs> but then there's a third level, which is the level of the text. Exactly. Everything yeah, yeah. is written, right? It's notated, it's mm. scripted. Uh, and of course, it's their script. Uh, there. <laughs> and I don't know, I mean, you know, we heard the presentations yeah. earlier that Madeline was doing uh, the writing, but this is commonly authored. Uh, and so I was wondering, actually, who might have <laughs> to have written the dialogue, and did they really, each of them, who speaks really every time <laughs> that it's under Mandolin or uh, Arakawa speaking, yeah. is it really them or someone <laughs> else wrote their lines? And why do they split these lines between yeah. them and how? <laughs> these kinds of things, so that they're already there. And, and you're, you're also doing a question, you started actually with a question that it, it was, uh, if, I, if I'm not wrong, where are we? Where are we? Yeah. And, or they, yeah. And this goes to Lucy's uh, presentation uh, on the books. I don't know where Lucy is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually the fact that we're uh, reenacting somehow many of these works and the exhibition is reenacting them in, in a particular way to the design as well. <laughs> so in a way we're also part of this uh, visit uh, that Angela and Roberts are having. In the, in, 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 and also in your case it's, it's different because we're not the audience of the actual choreography puzzle um, uh, that you're presenting, mm -hmm. but we're kind of uh, experiencing it through the mediation of a performance that you two are doing here. Uh, so what is the way that this uh, uh, previous experiences, in your case, the tentative, the previous tentative experiments of this choreography, in, in your case, Spiros, the uh, reenacting of this text, uh, is uh, mediating also, as, or is producing another tentative layer uh, in which these works are, are enacted, basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sorry, I'm thinking it through. Uh, with, I, I guess it's a, it's a prop proposition to, <laughs> to my audience that I've, I've never had before, so um, trying to go beyond spectacle and, yeah. and um, what, what's there, what, what am I asking the audience mm -hmm. to do, they, they, they can't uh, view as um, uh, passive spectators anymore, they, they're invited in and part of the work, mm -hmm. um, yeah, literally stepping into, into the work, onto the page, and their actions influence mm -hmm. um, both performers and other audience members' experience. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, but I, I love that idea. I, I guess I'm a big fan of improvisation, both <laughs> in dance and music. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's coloured and shaped my uh, uh, alongside <laughs> Araka and Gin's tentativeness. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the very uh, idea of the architecture of promenade, uh, as I said, it originates in this text, but then of course you have Corbusier who yeah. turns into a building. Uh, and now it goes back to text uh, here, right? That's the uh, reversible yeah. character of it. So, yes, uh, I mean, that's the way to implicate your reader, right? Empathetically, <laughs> right? Even almost kinesthetically, even if one. They have this wonderful scene here uh, where actually they're asking you to do an experiment with a book. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. uh, far close to your face, etc., in order to realize your kinesthetic possibilities. So mm -hmm. there are multiple ways of reading, in fact, mm -hmm. and, and not just sitting. How do you think this work relates to, for instance, the discussion that happened in Princeton last night? Their work, uh, and the, the whole. But basically, yeah, the question is about how do you contextualize this within the whole uh, tradition of kinesthetic, of kinesthetic in, in, in architecture? Yeah, uh, no. The, discussion by Zenep we uh, heard uh, yesterday, it was precisely about the sort of uh, um, 
practical application of these physio, uh, uh, physio psychical experiments of the 19th yeah. century uh, in order to induce this idea of actually <coughs> control of the body. Uh, yeah. What seems very natural, very bodily, uh, actually is a means of control. And yeah. I think that's precisely when I said they play with normative uh, yeah. modes that they are trying to reverse. So it's one of these attempts actually to escape this psycho control that all of mm -hmm. these psychic techniques involved in yeah. design processes through the Bauhaus, Black Mountain College, uh, wherever Albers and others um, uh, uh, t taught, uh, in fact, to turn them on their head, mm -hmm. know, I would say. But they are based on very similar principles. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So let's go on with the next panel. Thank you very much.